The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi for the World War I Historical Association. On October 2nd and 3rd of 2015, a collaboration symposium was held between the WW1HA and the League of World War I Aviation Historians. This series presents the seminars offered at that symposium. I really welcome the opportunity to talk about uh, a subject that has uh, been interesting for many years. I've been, uh, there we go. Okay, I, I've been uh, talking, thinking about this subject for, you know, I learned about it, I think as a kid even, we're always talking about, you know, the U-boats, they were always the bad guys and uh, uh, sneaking around and sinking hospital ships and things like that. But, uh, so when I got old enough and I was looking at uh, getting drafted, I decided to uh, go to officer's candidate school. And uh, I, as you can see, I'm wearing glasses. And I wanted to fly air. I wanted to fly airplanes and be really a superhero type guy, but unfortunately I'm nearsighted, and so I had to take the second back thing, which was submarines, and I'm glad I did. I spent um, the better part of five years of my naval career uh, on three different submarines: one in uh, San Diego and two in Pearl Harbor, and um, that tweaked my interest. And one of the things that was most interesting to me is one. Uh, in San Diego, we turned over a submarine to uh, the German Navy, and I got to meet uh, two German officers that had served uh, in the Mediterranean on uh, new boats, and it was very exciting just talking to these guys about you know, what it was really like uh, in the submarines. Uh, a little side note, if, if you ever want to really get a good picture, we were talking about this at dinner, you want to get a good picture of what submarine life was like for the U-boats, the booby dust boat, something like that. Uh, it is extremely accurate, and uh, you can just smell the diesel fumes when you watch that movie. Well, let's talk about the... U-505. What? The U-505 is here in That's right, the U-505. I haven't seen that in 20 years. I understand it moved it uh, inside, and uh, it's a wonderful exhibit, so hopefully sometime I'll get to... Unfortunately, I'm going home tomorrow, so I, I better have to plan that for the next trip out here. Let's talk about the establishment of the German submarine force in the First World War. Interestingly enough, uh, at the turn of the century, the Germans had no submarines. The British had uh, close to 50 submarines. The Americans had been working on them. Uh, the French had them. We, uh, in uh, 1903, the Russian Navy uh, applied to the Krupp shipbuilding firm to construct three submarines for the inaugural ships of the Russian submarine force. And good Germans were interested in that. And they immediately stole the, stole the plans and uh, <laughs> check it out, checked it out. The interesting thing though is that they did not have support from the high command. Uh, Admiral Turbitz, head of the German uh, Navy, uh, was known to have said that the Germans have no interest in submarines. What are they good for? They're uh, uh, a disgraceful, uh, thing to knighthood, and the Germans would not uh, want to participate in such an evil expedition. Unfortunately enough, but fortunately, uh, he learned otherwise very quickly. And um, so, after the Germans got the uh, plans for these three just three Russian submarines, they came they worked for uh, two years and came up with the uh, U-1. Which was a composite of the uh, Russian three Russian sh uh, submarines that were being constructed by Krupp. Uh, the thing, this is a small submarine, as you can see by the size. 
Uh, it was only 140 feet long. It had a, da a draft of, uh, of 10 feet, only 10 feet. The, the uh, armament on it was very uh, inadequate. All it had was one torpedo tube forward and one torpedo was stored aft of that torpedo tube in the forward torpedo room. The problems with this original submarine was, first off, uh, the Germans did not want to build a submarine that was propelled by gasoline engines, so they adopted a kerosene uh, propulsion plant, which uh, was more efficient, actually, than the diesel, because the diesel had a propensity in uh, several cases with the British and the Americans of blowing up and uh, causing uh, excess fumes throughout the submarine. It was very difficult to uh, uh, control. So he, they went with the kerosene, and um, unfortunately that's not very powerful. The bad things about kerosene, one of the worst things is that the, uh, it, they're very, uh, they consume tremendous amounts of fuel, but the worst thing of all is they give off a white exhaust smoke that is so uh, intense that it can be seen uh, upwards of five miles at sea. So that, that is one of the things that we definitely were working against is uh, something like that that signals to uh, any bad guy that, uh, hey, there's a submarine over the horizon. I can tell it's one of those new German submarines with all that, with that kerosene. In any event, uh, they immediately uh, continually uh, upgraded and by, and then in the following year, they came up with the U-2, which instead of having just one torpedo tube, they had one forward and one aft. And uh, the only problem was that they forgot to work about work on how high the uh, how high the periscopes got out of the water. And all these early periscopes were only uh, only gave them about four feet of free. Uh, by the time they raised that periscope, there's only about four feet of a periscope above the top of the sail. So there was a propensity, especially if you fire a torpedo, uh, it uh, the buoyancy of the submarine changed dramatically and it tended to pop up. And so as soon as you fired a torpedo, you would expose your periscope and the uh, and the conning tower. So they finally uh, decided, uh, uh, let's add about 15 feet to the periscope, which they did and solved that problem. The other thing with these early submarines was they had a, uh, you could see forward there, that, that is a, a radio antenna and aft is a ventilation pipe to con to give oxygen to the uh, internal I engines. And of course, the submerged, they used a battery-powered electric uh, electric uh, motors. To charge the batteries, you had to surface, and you had to uh, shut, the, you had to uh, reverse the, uh, your, your uh, propulsion engines and uh, charge your batteries through your electric motors to uh, generate, to uh, recharge the, uh, the, the, uh, the batteries underneath it. So it was, it was just a very uneconomical type, an unsatisfactory type of weapon. Uh, looking, looking on the right, there you can see the outside of the U-2. They finally realized that uh, to have good surface characteristics, surface transiting characteristics, they had to add uh, some width to the submarine and so that's why that, that extra uh, four feet on either side of the submarine, which is a uh, external ballast tank, uh, gives a much better surface transiting characteristics. Uh, everybody says, well, well, why are we worried about that? Well, uh, until uh, the invention of snorkel and nuclear power, uh, submarines spent 90% of their time on the surface because they were very, uh, their propulsion systems were very inef inefficient. A submerged, you can't very well run a diesel engine uh, while you're submerged because if you did, you'd exhaust your oxygen supply in about three minutes. So um, that's that was the problem that they had. The other thing that they had with this submarine is that those two masts, the forward uh, radio mast and the uh, 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 ventilation mast aft, had to be hand cranked down from the top side of the submarine. So so much for crash dives. Uh, the captain said, well, it's time to die in a boat. And so the lucky uh, bosuns would have to run out there and crank these masts down. And so consequently, instead of about a, two, um, a minute and a half or a two minute dive, it was usually uh, seven and a half to eight minutes to get down below, to get to periscope depth. So 
all in all, these were just not working out well, but God bless the Germans. They certainly, they recognized this is not gonna work, and they uh, began, they came up with uh, uh, the German High Command, the German High, C High uh, Naval Command came up with the, this five-point wish list for submarines. First off, they wanted a top speed of 15 knots on the surface of 10 knots submerged. The current, the, the U1, U2, and the the following, U2, U3 and 4, could make uh, at best about 11 knots on the surface and about 7 to 8 knots submerged. Uh, they only had a range of 600 miles. The Admiralty said, no, we need 2,000 miles because what this would do is give them capability to get submarines on the western uh, edge of the British Isles and and be available to uh, sink targets that are com coming in from the uh, western approaches to the British Isles. Uh, the crew sizes averaged about 11 people and this last, this number four, 74 air capability, I don't know where they came up with that because uh, even the submarines that I was on uh, unless you got up and uh, put a snorkel mast up or something like that or uh, got up and, and exposed your conning tower uh, you could only stay uh, submerged about 24 hours because you'd be running low on oxygen uh, the torpedo tubes on, on the early boats there was only one on either end and they said no we want two and two plus uh, two in the uh, plus, uh, one uh, reload torpedo so they could have a total of six torpedoes is the total for the uh, capability of the submarine. And again, I've explained, pretty much explained what these problems were with that kerosene engine, the uh, heavy exhaust smoke, heavy fuel consumption, uh, the problem with those, hot, those low periscopes, the very low mass, and the long diving time. So anyway, this is what the U, they came up with the U5 through the U18, and these were still uh, kerosene propelled. Uh, they made some dramatic changes and they widened the, uh, the beam on the submarine and made it much more, much more capable of uh, uh, good surface uh, transiting skills. They uh, got rid of the, eventually they got rid of that damn uh, ventilation uh, duck that you can see in the after part and the, they uh, adjusted the uh, cranking down of the submarines, the cranking down of the antennas was made so the uh, it could happen, uh, it could be handled inside the submarine so the guys didn't have to run out and, and crank them down. Uh, but still, it still there was about a five, it still was a five to, five to seven minute evolution to, to submerge. But you're going to see more about the U-9. This is the wonderful thing about submariners is that uh, they make do with what they've got, and the U-9 had a very successful career at the start of the war. Uh, commencing with the U-19, uh, so we're talking, we're talking the U-1 through the U, U-1 through 4 were just, uh, you know, pretty much experimental. Uh, they ended up, uh, uh, the U-1 and the U-2 ended up being uh, uh, training vessels for the rest of the war. And the U-3 and 4 uh, did not work out at all. In fact, the U-3 sank on its uh, maiden uh, voyage after over after being uh, 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 sea trials. And uh, they said, "Okay, enough with the uh, with the, enough with the kerosene engines." And the U come see with the U-19. They put in a man, uh, Manlinger, Nuremberg uh, diesel engines, which were uh, 850 horsepower and a big improvement over the uh, uh, kerosene so that 19 through, well in fact all German submarines from the 19 through, uh, all German submarines from 1913 uh, through the end of the war were all diesel. In fact, they were all diesel till the end of the Second World War. Uh, the other thing that was key was that they invited, they in, installed a 8 millimeter, 88 deck gun on the forward part of every submarine. Uh, it was recognized that torpedoes are expensive and uh, we only have so many of them so the best deal is to surface and sink the, your, your target with a with your deck gun and you'll see uh, with especially with the U-35 
uh, the uh, skipper of that uh, ended up sinking like 450,000 tons of, of uh, merchant shipping with uh, about 90% of it was done with his deck gun. He did that with, uh, anyway, we'll talk about that in a sec. Anyway, so there you go with the 19 through the 45. Now, here is what, starting with about the U-23, this is what the submarine looked like. So remember what that damn U-1 looked like. And this is what I think is just marvelous about the German engineering is that uh, none of the Allies ever came up with a submarine this good. In fact, this submarine here, this is the uh, U-35 of the class of the U-19 uh, through the U-45. But it was, uh, it's, uh, it was 212 feet long. It had two 1,100-horsepower uh, diesel engines in it. It had the 88-millimeter deck gun at a top speed on the surface of uh, 18 knots, 11 knots submerged, and carried uh, seven tor six torpedoes, two forward, two aft, and, and two in the racks. Uh, when you look at, uh, and they had very good surface carry, uh, surface transiting car characteristics, as you can see, the wide uh, 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 ballast tank uh, on either side to give it good stability on the surface. And there's a line diagram on it there. In any event, um, this became the prototype for the Type 7 U-boat, which was uh, used, the primary submarine used by the German Navy in uh, the Second World War for the first uh, three years of the war. So this is what I just, this is what I, it's just amazing is that these guys went from 1905 effectively to 1913, and uh, they did what uh, the Western power, what the Allies had took uh, 25 years to do, but they did it in uh, uh, seven, eight years. Unbelievable. And it's and in and, and a few minutes we'll show you that the past uh, the the creme de la creme, which is the uh, UB3, which was also used just about exactly as it was designed in the First World War it, into 1943 by the German uh, submarine force. Here's a summary of the of pre-war construction. There were uh, 40, 45 boats uh, constructed and put in service during that time. Of course, the, one th the U1 through U4 reduced that down. Uh, it, it became actually, the, uh, when the war started, they were ready to go with about 38 submarines. The planners, had said that this is the way the distribution would, would be in case of war. How many people know what the German bite is? Okay, it took me a while to figure that out. Okay, it is the uh, area in the North Sea from the top of the Danish Peninsula to the uh, north shores of, of the Netherlands. Uh, that is called the German bite, and that would defend the German ports of uh, Bremerhaven and uh, Williamshaven, which were the two main uh, German submarine uh, ports in the German uh, homeland to serve, to operate in the North Sea. Why they had 12 submarines in Kiel, I don't know, uh, other than the fact it was their, probably their home port or something. But the thing about at Kiel, of course, it's on the other side of Denmark, and with a very difficult transit to get into the North Sea, which uh, British submarines had a propensity to number one, mine the Skagerrak, and also be standing by to uh, take a pot shot at any uh, submarines that exited that area. There were 10 submarines in reserve, and only 12 uh, on defensive, but again, when you figure, this was a fort planning for a 70 boat uh, employment. Well, actually, uh, there was only uh, 38 boats available, so when you figure it's about 55%, but so that puts about Seven of the seven submarines available for offensive operations. So this gives you an indication how little confidence at, in the start, before just before the war started, that the German High Command had in the ability of submarines to be an effective uh, offensive weapon when they only could supply out of out of the entire submarine force. It could only allow seven to be going out on patrol. Uh, they had, a, in addition, they had some uh, difficulties with delivery, but. Um, and even, in any event, by, by April of 1915, they had the 38 boats there and more coming. 
Here's the areas that we talked about. If you can see, uh, oops, I forgot how to do that. Thank you. There uh, is the areas of, areas initially of operations in the at the start of the war. The British uh, planted a, a significant minefield. You can see up north from the from Scapa Flow to the uh, uh, Norway. They mined uh, along the German uh, coast there of Denmark to uh, the Netherlands, and then uh, some mining done in the uh, English Channel. Okay, uh, and <clears throat> um, in the fall and uh, fall and early year, early winter of uh, 1915. Uh, of course, the German army was doing their thing, and they captured uh, pretty much all of Belgium. This opened up the Belgian ports of Ostend and uh, Zeebrugge to the uh, uh, German submarines. And the Germans responded by that by building what they called uh, these UB-1s, or tadpole submarines. They were only 75 feet long. They had uh, two torpe uh, torpedo tube, four and a half. They had a crew of 11. and uh, they had a max surface speed of five knots on the surface and uh, about four knots submerged. But all they wanted them to have them do was to be able to go over, across the channel. They had a range of about 600 miles. All they had to do was make the, the transit from the, from the Zeebrugge and uh, Ostend to the uh, English ports in the channel. And they, uh, by uh, late 1915, they even started equipping these uh, little so these little tadpoles with mines, and there were, uh, in addition to, uh, they took, they took, converted some of these with uh, made of mine layers. They they changed the uh, torpedo tubes, four and a half to uh, mine laying tubes, and the first of them had uh, they had twelve. The each tube had, uh, let's see, had twelve mines in it. Six, yeah, twelve mines. So they could go carry 12 mines up to uh, up to uh, a deal or someplace like that on the English on the English side of the channel or, or right outside, and uh, then they even uh, added some more length and uh, armament to the to some future of those small UBs, and uh, they ended up with what they called the, well by the way the mine supers were called the mine layers were called UCs so they, the UCs they they uh, uh, added one more mine. Uh, Two, and so they could lay 18 mines on any, any transit from uh, Ostend over to uh, the British coast. And incidentally, their main armament on the surface was a machine gun. So it was kind of a guts ball deal for, your, for one of the crew members. Here is a picture of, you can get a good picture of the, sub, the submarine I talked about earlier, the U, U-35, that was a really great submarine. Here's a tadpole alongside her in the Mediterranean. So you can see she's about one third the size of the, of the normal submarine. And, but again, the typical submarine, submariners, they volunteered no matter what it was, as long as it, as long as it hopefully you got back. Okay, there's the mine layers, uh, the, the UCs that I told you about, the one, the U, UB that they changed to a, uh, a mine layer that had 12 mines, and then the one below it is the UC three class, and uh, that had uh, 18 mines in the fort area. Now here's the uh, submarine that uh, that made uh, the uh, German sub the, that really was the icing on the cake of the German submarine force in World War One. This was the UB. Three class, and these are the most. Uh, they built. Uh, they built 49 of these. That's the largest uh, construction they made throughout the war. And these were an exact duplicate, like the uh, previous one, like the uh, U-35 class that we saw. We saw again. This was again carried on into World War II as one of the uh, main armament submarines in the, in the uh, German submarine force. It had four. It was 180 feet long, had four torpedoes forward, plus 
four in the racks and two torpedo tubes at for a total of uh, three, four, and eight, eight and 12 torpedoes that carried on board. It was a very lethal uh, submarine and had many, many successes along. Uh, it was uh, 600 tons, as I indicated, 180 uh, feet long, had an 18 foot beam, so had very good uh, sea transiting characteristics. And the propulsion was two 110, two 1100 uh, horsepower diesels, uh, 14 knot speed surfaced, eight knots submerged, and a range of 9,000 miles. And again, this is another one that was aimed particularly at the Western approaches to the British Isles to uh, uh, interdict any uh, merchant traffic coming to Great Britain. So summary of the wartime conduct. What was the, what's, what's the staircase thing in front of it? Is that what okay, it is? that is a, uh, an input device to, to cut a uh, submarine mine, not a submarine net, uh, like a scapa flow. They had, you know, the entrance of the harbor was there was a mine, there was a uh, submarine net across that. Uh, great story of World War II submarine is Gunther Prine, uh, probably the greatest German U boat skipper. Took uh, the equivalent of a UB 3 in there in 1941 and sank uh, a British carrier, a British aircraft carrier. The Royal Oak. The Royal Oak, okay. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Saved by the bell. <laughs> uh, okay, then this is the the British blockade. Of course, was having its effect on on. Well, I'm going to better explain the other thing. Both the British and the uh, and the Germans realized that uh, after stalemate on the Western Front, they had to really beef up their blockade, and that both sides said, "We've got the uh, equipment. We can starve out the bad guys." So. The submarines were charged with, the U-boats were charged with, with blockading uh, Great Britain, and by uh, 1917, and we'll cover that, by the 1917, they darn did it, of starving the British out. And the other side of the coin, though, is the British uh, high seas fleet was able to do the same thing to the Germans. By 1916, there were food riots in Germany, and uh, it was, they both sides did a terrific job of, uh, of blockading and uh, of all merchant traffic into the into their respective enemies. Now this is the, called the U cruisers. Uh, as an effort to elude the British blockade, they brought out they built these about twelve of these huge submarines. By those their standards, they were in excess of three hundred feet long. Uh, they were twenty five hundred tons, and they could carry a thousand tons of. Uh, 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 of, of cargo, and the cruiser Deutschland in 1916 did a, a voyage from Bremerhaven to uh, Baltimore and picked up uh, 800 tons of cargo from the United States, loaded it in there. It was uh, rubber, nickel, and tin items that were difficult to get a hold of, and obviously in, in uh, blockaded Germany and return safely to uh, Great Britain. The plan was to uh, get about, like I said, about 12 of these. The second one was the Bremen, same size. Uh, it embarked for America, and uh, unfortunately, that was the last was ever seen. It was lost with all hands, and they had no idea what ever happened to it. Uh, finally, they realized, bang for the buck, this is not the thing they have, so they converted the remaining uh, 10 submarines to uh, long-range cruisers, they put uh, three, or put four torpedo tubes, put four, four and a half, and two uh, huge deck guns on them, and they were able to make uh, a transit to the eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, but by the time they were really be, were becoming effective, the war, the war was just about over. So as I indicated, war goals. Uh, let's just kind of go year by year with what happened with the, some examples of what the submarines were able to do. <clears throat> oh, there's a, there's a summary of uh, wartime production by the uh, Germans in the U-boats. You can see 80, the, uh, the two best, the U-boats and the UB-3s were almost 170 uh, 
subreddits built, uh, and and you can see that the concentration on the UB3s were primarily in 1917 and 18. Uh, okay, starting in 1914, there's the war goals. Okay, 1914, uh, there were three when they, again, they were under the scrutiny of Admiral Turbots, who was, again, bad-mouthing the submarines. And uh, the first uh, three patrols that they made, they had no uh, successful results. In fact, uh, three of the submarines, there was 12 submarines they sent out, and three were lost, and they, nobody had sunk anything uh, on those three initial patrols. This was in August of 19. Uh, 14. So Turbots immediately said, see you, I told you so. Well, this all stopped in September of uh, 1917, uh, 1914. Uh, Captain Leighton Otto Hershey and the U-21 uh, sank uh, HMS Pathfinder cruiser with one torpedo. It hit the magazine and the and the uh, cruiser sank in three minutes, with all, lost with all hands. It was the first time that a submarine had sunk a man of war in the history of warfare, and it started to uh, give the submarines a little better name. This was followed on quickly by Captain, or by Lieutenant Otto Petting in the U-9, which is the one we saw the diagram of. Uh, he's on patrol in the uh, English Channel. He had, had, uh, had expended he had, he had one with the six torpedoes on board. He'd expended uh, three of them already, and he was ready to uh, head for home. He had spent the previous night uh, on the bottom, resting his crew in, trans in anticipation of uh, the transit to uh, back to Germany. Uh, on surfacing, he was having lunch in the, up on the bridge. When one of the lookouts said, Captain, uh, there's smoke on the horizon. In fact, there's three smoke, three uh, evidences of three ships out there. Uh, Vetting and took a peek with his binoculars, and sure enough, there were three British cruisers that were on patrol coming over the horizon. And typical, uh, early in the war, they were not zigzagging, they were not doing anything, they were just cruising along, kind of like a Sunday afternoon cruise, not paying attention. They, and un unfortunately for the three cruisers, they were headed right for where the, uh, the U-9 had now submerged and was waiting for them. Uh, as they approached, uh, vetting and set up on the first one, which was the HMS Abu Kir. He fired one torpedo, bullseye. The Abu Kir starts to sink. The uh, HMS Hogue was the second one. Uh, it was uh, uh, trailing him, and uh, they all, both thought that they'd hit a mine, so he came up alongside the Abu Kir to uh, take, take uh, uh, casualties off and rescue the crew. Uh, Betty and obliging, they put a torpedo in her and uh, she began to sink. And finally, the, uh, the final uh, cruiser came up alongside, uh, again thinking it was a mine, but then about the, that's about the time that he fired at the Hogue and it, that thing that I told you about, it, the uh, increased buoyancy of the submarine caused the sail to be exposed, and they finally recognized, hey, it's not a mine, it was a submarine. So the uh, Chrissy, which was the third cruiser, uh, commenced firing at the, at the uh, U-9, but unfortunately, uh, he had, uh, Betty and had uh, loaded a torpedo in the stern tubes and got him with a stern shot and uh, they were they were toast. So in effect, this guy had sunk three uh, armored cruisers in the space of a half an hour with a uh, submarine that was a 450 ton submarine. Uh, it was one of the old uh, 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 kerosene based boats, you know, that, uh, that the Kurt, Kurt, uh, that uh, Turbot thought was worthless. Needless to say, he changed his opinion on that uh, after that. Uh, about two weeks later, the Paladin was sunk, the Russian uh, cruiser was sunk by the U-26. HMS Hawk, Weddington was not ready to uh, 
ready to go home yet, I guess, because he sank the HMS Hawk uh, about two weeks later also, making it four cruisers. And then, the, then two submariners, this is the worst of all. Um, the uh, U-27 sank a British submarine, uh, the E-3, uh, in October. Now this is a very significant sinking. This is the U-17 sinking the Glitra, which was a uh, uh, merchant ship. And this was the first merchant ship that was uh, sunk, bringing, that was bringing supplies to Great Britain. That's the first, uh, first one that was sunk in what was become, you know, literally uh, a thousand merchant ship sunk by German submarines. But this was number one. So that pretty much winded up, wound up uh, 1914, Needless to say, uh, Turbitz changed his opinion. The toll, the uh, bottom line from uh, 19, 13, 1914 was five submarines were lost. Allied losses were 500 tons. I mean, excuse me, yeah, Allied losses were 500 tons. Uh, that was just a drop in the bucket of what's to come. Uh, looking at, uh, okay, now let's take a look at. 19, and we're going to look at 1915. Uh, in February, Kaiser proclaimed a war zone around the United Kingdom and re unrestricted warfare began. Causing This was caused because of the intense increase in American uh, uh, maritime traffic and other neutral countries shipping all kinds of goods to the British Isles. So he said, you know, have at it, guys. It's time to time to wrap this thing up. So February 22nd, the unrestricted, the first time unrestricted submarine warfare was, was declared. And March through May of that year, 123 uh, merchant ships were sunk by German submarines. Here's the uh, public relations uh, disaster of the century. Uh, the Germans are always so good at that. Uh, May the 1st, 1915, New York, the Canard Liner Lusitania takes on 1,257 passengers, 197 of them are Americans, and uh, departs for Liverpool. Uh, the Great Circle Route is to take, him, is to take the uh, uh, Lusitania via Fishnet Rock, which is on the south coast of Ireland, up through the Irish Channel to uh, the Irish Sea and into, uh, into Liverpool. The, uh, this was the 101st transit for the Lusitania, so it was a supposedly a no-brainer type thing. They've been doing it for all this time. Why should it change at all? The German embassy, however, published in the New York Times that morning, the day of sailing, a warning saying, you're traveling through you're carrying a British a belligerent flag. You're traveling through uh, contested waters, and there are submarines there that have got instructions to sink uh, ships of the British with carrying the British flag. Uh, Captain Turner of the Lusitania said, "Don't worry about it." He said, we we can make 22 knots. The uh, only uh, unfortunately, they were only had four, three, three of their four boilers on the line, so their speed was more like 18, but still. They were significantly faster than any submarine could do. And he said also, once we get near Ireland, we'll have the protection of the Royal Navy. Well, that was a lot of uh, hooey because the Royal Navy was concerned about a new battleship that they had just launched, and most of them were, were sheltering this guy uh, on up to the northern part of Ireland. So there was really hardly any um, protection when, by the time they got to uh, the British Isles. So, uh, as the Lusitania got closer to uh, England on May the 6th, uh, they received uh, messages from the Admiralty warning them that there were submarine traffic uh, south on the, on the south coast of, there were submarines spotted on the south coast of Ireland, and this was, uh, you know, dangerous waters be on the lookout. Uh, before he went to dinner that night, uh, Captain Turner had them uh, rig out the lifeboats, close watertight doors, 
and instructed passengers as much as possible to uh, close their, per their uh, portholes. Uh, uh, the following morning on the 7th, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, he received another message from the Admiralty stating there are submarines spotted off Fishnet Rock in sure Lusitania gets this message or words to that, words to that effect. Uh, again, uh, no change of plans. Uh, Captain Turney decided to uh, come in closer to land uh, as a precaution uh, in case something did happen and also to get a better fix on, the, uh, on his position. Unfortunately, uh, at 12 o'clock, he was approaching uh, uh, Queenstown, which was uh, where they were going to make a stop prior to going on to Liverpool. He came about 20 degrees to starboard, uh, so that, excuse me, about 2 o'clock. Meanwhile, the U-20, I forgot, U-20 had been watching this whole thing. Captain Schreiber of the U-20 uh, had uh, a torpedo ready to go in the forward torpedo tube and uh, had uh, 1410, as I indicated, the uh, Lusitania comes to starboard and presents the classic which every submariner loves, a 90 degree track angle for that torpedo. It's gonna hit, hit the side of that ship with a 90 degree angle uh, amidships. Uh, he was only 700 yards away and it was like kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. He fires a torpedo and uh, it hits the Lusitania. It's a tremendous explosion. The uh, Lusitania takes a a big starboard list and also starts sinking by the bow. Uh, he lowered out, he rigged out the lifeboats on the on the starboard side so you could see this, those lifeboats on the starboard side were either flooded or lost or were too far out uh, from the main deck for the passengers to board them. Those on the port side were already banging against the side of the ship because of the list. So none of the lifeboats were really operational. Uh, and then the speed that the Lusitania was going was probably around 17 knots. Uh, when the submarine, when the torpedo hit, uh, there was no reduction in speed. And so uh, it just, water just literally poured into the, into the, uh, into the hull of the, uh, of the, of the Lusitania. The, Within 17 minutes, it, it had sunk. Uh, there were um, a total of 1,198 people who were killed. 128 of them were Americans. There was great jubilee in Germany because they claimed it was a troop ship. Uh, and it had been harassing the submarine. In fact, Germans, again, and their wonderful ability to, to get the best out of a, a bad situation, they, they uh, print, uh, manufactured a medal. It's called the Lusitania Medal, uh, which was given out to the public. And it has a picture of the Lusitania sinking, and uh, uh, agents for Canard are looking like issuing tickets to the, on the reverse side, are issuing tickets to the passengers, and the, the agents all look like they're all skeletons. So, uh, needless to say, another great public relations. President Wilson heard this, and he was, you know, had been very upset about the uh, wholesale sinking of uh, supposedly helpless uh, merchant ships. And uh, here this thing is, and he apparently broke down in, in tears, uh, instructed the German ambassador in Berlin to uh, voice uh, his utmost displeasure over this whole thing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I guess you didn't, I don't say cooler heads prevailed, but uh, there was no uh, there was no breaking off of uh, diplomatic relations with the United States at this time. Here's so so many of the people were uh, that were uh, so many of the casualties from the sinking were unidentified, and there's a mass grave uh, in uh, Ireland over some of the people that some of the bodies that floated ashore. Uh, with uh, the headlines of the uh, New York Herald telling about the catastrophe. Uh, 
merchant ship losses, well, merchant ship losses at this time were uh, continuing to rise, but under pressure, the Germans finally did snuggle under, and they said, uh, they told the submarines to stay clear of neutrals, and in particular, stay clear of passenger ships. But that was the uh, only two uh, concessions that they made. Uh, through August, like I said, through August of 1915, there were 365 um, uh, ships sunk by, uh, 365 merchant ships sunk by the Germans. And uh, so the, the, the uh, terror just continues. This is the, uh, this is one of the things that's, oh my gosh, here we go again. This is one of the, uh, I won't say phony things, but this is the one where uh, both sides were being, weren't being truthful with each other. Um, here's the Kaiser on one side saying, we, we got the right to, to sink these guys without warning. And the, and the British say, well, no, you got to observe what's called the prize rule. The prize rule is, you see a, you see a target, you uh, surface, you fire a shot across their bow, you have the uh, uh, ship, the, that you're approach that you've told to stop. You send a, a boarding party board, check to see if there are any contraband on there, or and then if there is, uh, you are, is or is not, depending on what they discover, uh, they have the right to sink it. But however, before they do, they, the crew is allowed to enter, uh, get in the lifeboats, and pull away from the uh, condemned ship. So. It's kind of a, a, you know, it's a good way of not, you know, you're not going to kill anybody. You're going to just uh, wipe out the uh, uh, contraband or the uh, the cargo that they're carrying to the belligerent power. However, the British thought this is really, that's, you know, it's wonderful that they're doing this, and I, I mean, certainly encourage it. But what they decided to do was just as dirty as the Germans. They had what they called the Q-ships. And these were armed merchantmen that were disguised as tramps. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there's, you can see the, uh, uh, they had uh, four different uh, batteries on that, on that particular uh, merchant ship. And then you can see what it was disguised at in different situations. One is a American tramp, one is a Belgian or a French tramp, and the other is a, uh, I think, Swedish, I can't tell from here. But in any event, the, you know, the theory was that the, you would see this unarmed merchantman out there surface and just start to give them the rigmarole about, you know, kind of laying to and getting a, uh, checking the car cargo and making sure that there was no, no uh, illegal cargo in there and then sinking it. Well, as soon as the submarine would surface, the shields and tarps that they had over the guns were dropped and they'd start shooting at the Germans and uh, destroy the submarine. Uh, something's wrong there, anyway. Here, and now here's an example of the first, the first encounter uh, of, the, of one of these Q-ships. Uh, the U-27 had just sunk a, a, a merchant ship earlier in the day, early in the day on August the 19th, and they were cruising in the uh, South Channel when uh, they spotted a uh, Swedish uh, merchant ship, the Nicosian, steaming on a course uh, 090, according to this, on this chart anyway, 090. But on the other, then the U-27 you can see is, is uh, north of the uh, uh, target, and about the time they, they're starting to fire a shot to the uh, uh, Nicosian to get them to uh, uh, lay, lay to, they notice another uh, tramp coming up on the, that bottom there where the B is, and that's that was the Barlong. But the Barlong was one of the Q ships. And uh, so they fired a shot across the Barlong's bow and said, okay, play two, we'll get, we'll get both you dudes. Uh, no sooner they'd done that, the Barlong vanished behind the uh, Nicosian, so they didn't see it. Well, as soon as they went around behind the Nicosian and uh, were, were away from the view of the uh, U-27, the barricades came down, the tarp tarps came off, and the barrel came around 
on the starboard side of the Nicosian and fired at the uh, U-27 and sank it. Uh, what made this even more uh, disastrous, I won't say disastrous, but more really kind of dirty pool was the fact that uh, most of the German uh, crewmen were able to exit the submarine and they swam to the that Nicosian and they climbed aboard the Nicosian hoping that they would just be interned. Well, the uh, Barlong now, the skipper of the Barlong had taken off his fake beard and uh, looked like a lieutenant in the Royal Navy, which he was, and uh, they boarded the uh, Nicosian, discovered that there was about 12 of the crewmen from the U-27 on board, so he told them all to, to shoot them. So they shot, they murdered all, all the uh, German uh, submariners around board because they didn't want to dis disclose the fact that this Q-ship thing was was uh, with the new secret weapon of the, of the Royal Navy. Not exactly uh, according to Hoyle. Okay, 1915 now ends, ends uh, with uh, a couple more ships being sunk with U.S. lives lost. Schweiger and the U-20 accounted for the Hesperian, which was one of the ships that, that, uh, that the American lives were all lost on. And he, of course, was the skipper of the U-20 when he was on the, the St. Lusitania. Uh, for your information, he was, uh, I'm sorry. he was killed uh, uh, two, uh, two years later on the uh, when he was the skipper of the U-88 and uh, his ship was rammed by a British cruiser and sunk, so uh, I guess he got his just desserts, desserts uh, two years later. 1915 ends with, uh, okay. No, that's that one. Okay, 1915 ends anyway with uh, German submarines there were 20 German submarines lost, uh, but that's still acceptable, and they sank 1.3 million tons of, of shipping. 1916. Uh, this is kind of a screwy year. The uh, Supreme Commander of the uh, German uh, Service Forces and uh, Admiral Turbots got together and said, let's do a combined operation to, to really see if we can entice the the British Navy to come out of the Scapa Flow anchorages. And uh, so what they did is they uh, had the Navy, the German Navy was supposedly ready to uh, make a feint towards the, uh, like they're coming out of uh, their protected harbor, and this would bring out the, the Royal Navy. Well, they, they started it, but then uh, somebody on the, on the Navy side, unbeknownst the turbines, had got cold feet and said, I don't think this plan is going to work. So they didn't use the uh, submarine uh, ambush plan. And uh, Turbots, the guy that was hating submarines, uh, saw that this was a, he ruined it, what we thought was a great plan for practical use of the submarines and resigned. Uh, they tried it one more time that following year, and again, it was not, uh, not successful. Again, uh, unrestricted warfare uh, was uh, on again. This is the other thing that just, I think, really totally irritated the Americans, and is that, you know, the Kaiser never seemed to know whether he's going to have unrestricted warfare or, or he's going to stop it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, every time he put it back on, he ticked off the US of A war, and then he brought it back, and everything seemed to be fine. Anyway, long, event, long, thing, long story short is that, again, uh, American and German relations were not exactly uh, at, the, at the height of their uh, uh, acme. Uh, <clears throat> that unrestricted warfare res resumed in October. Uh, the German supply lines uh, continually uh, wreaked havoc with the uh, blockading, uh, with the uh, ships trying to come into the Great Britain. Within four months, there were another 290 ships sunk, and uh, this is when the UB-3, who we talked about, and the cruisers were now on the loose, and they were having a, uh, a field day with uh, sinking uh, uh, 
ships. Uh, this is this is one of the my, this is one of the fun things that I've discovered about. Uh, there was a continual. What happened? What did you? <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> well, I can tell you while we're working on it. Uh, the British said, we, you know, we've got to come up with a plan for uh, to better defeat these uh, damn submarines. There we go. In 1917, uh, they started coming up with some of these very strange anti-submarine measures. Uh, the one that I really like the best, well, first off, the one that was pretty simple, is that they gave a little hammers and leather pouches to the uh, patrol boats in the English Channel. And the theory was that when you saw a submarine periscope, you snuck up to it, and you took your little hammer out, <laughs> and you broke the glass on the periscope. <laughs> and then the guys, the Germans would say, how did that happen? <laughs> so when they raised the other periscope, you put the little hood over that. Oh, geez. <laughs> oh, I guess it was the other way around. They put the hood on first, and then the Germans would raise the periscope to see what happened, and then they would break the glass of the periscope. <laughs> Needless to say, this was not an effective <laughs> <laughs> And here's the one, this is the one that I really love. This was a guy, this British inventor says, we gotta come up with something that's really good. He said, what we can do is we'll train the seagulls. When they see a periscope, they will accumulate over the top of the periscope, and then we'll know there's a submarine there. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Well, how are you gonna do that? So he said, he had this decoy that he made. See, it's a, and the, part, the top part of it was look, it was on a big uh, cylinder. It looked kind of like a periscope and a conning tower. And underneath it, he had these gears, and uh, that you can see uh, that D was a hollow tube filled with uh, fish guts. <laughs> and you would tow this behind uh, a trawler, and the fish guts would be extruded up the end of that thing and come to the surface and the seagulls would associate the fish guts with the periscope that was sticking out of the water. And this gentleman, apparently, he towed this thing for about six months in the Irish Sea and the Admiralty still didn't buy into it. But he said the only reason was they didn't give me enough time. <laughs> Uh, this, this guy is a, an enigma to me. This fellow is a Lothar, uh, who's a good Frenchman, who can talk? Lothar Arnold de la Perriere. Thank you. He was a, he was the greatest submarine skipper of all time. I mean, it beat uh, Prine, he beat Red Ramage in the U.S., he beat them all. He uh, was a descendant of French Huguenots that uh, migrated to Germany in the 1700s. He was the captain of the U-35, which was that one we saw pictures of. And uh, he, was boat, uh, he was based in uh, Pola, which is a submarine, was a submarine base at the top at the Adriatic Sea uh, between Italy and uh, the Balkan and uh, Serbia. Uh, he, in one month, you know, a three-week period at, at one time, in, in 1915, 1916, he sank 51 merchantmen in a three-week period, and he only used four torpedoes. He was a true gentleman. He refused to sink somebody unannounced. He faithfully would observe the prize rule. He, surfaced, he would surface, fire the shot across the bow, evacuate the crew and then sink it. He preferred to use, not waste torpedoes on the merchantman. So there's a classic example. He, he uh, made a successful ship sinking 51 guys in, in a, less than a month 
and only fired to four torpedoes, and he had eight torpedoes on board. Uh, he preferred to use, I keep doing that, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. He preferred, he preferred to use his 88 millimeter. Well, here's the, here he is tied up, the center uh, submarine tied up at Poland in 1916. And he, and he preferred to use his 88 millimeter deck gun to take out the merchantman. Ironically, uh, he was the la he sank the last merchant ship in the war in October of 1918, and he survived the war. Uh, got you know like he sank a hundred he sank 150 450,000 tons of shipping. Uh, got the Blue Max, uh, rose to be an admiral, a rear admiral, a vice admiral in the uh, in uh, the World War II Navy, and unfortunately was killed. In an airplane crash, uh, air, a small Spicer storage crash in German, in uh, France in uh, 1941. But anyway, great submariner. And they, okay, by the end of 1916, 768 ships were sunk, 178 ships damaged, 23 U-boats were lost, and uh, now they've driven to, gone to 2.3 million tons shipping. Uh, the British blockade. Uh, was uh, successful, but again, however, uh, there were more ships seeming to get through, and uh, the Kaiser reinstated uh, unrestricted submarine warfare, and this finally was the straw that broke the camel's back in, in April the 6th of 1917. The U.S. Uh, declared war on Germany, and uh, that's when we entered the, entered the show. By March of 1917, uh, there was, I think, two weeks' supply of food in England. And the Germans thought they were going to be able to starve the British out. The British countered by uh, the invent, they have a new mine, you know, the one that looks like a uh, pincushion with all detonators sticking out all over the thing. They planted 80 of those in 80 excuse me, 80,000 of those in the, uh, in the submarine lanes and started to take a toll there. Uh, also, they finally came up with the uh, convoy solution. Until this time, the ships had all sailed independently. But now they stayed in the convoy so they could have uh, destroyer escorts to uh, guide them across the Atlantic. And things began to turn finally for the Allies. and. Uh, by the end of the year, uh, despite the fact that they lost, they sank 62, 6.2 million tons, they lost more submarines, three times more submarines than they ever lost before. So the, the tide was turning. They were now, until this time, they were able to build more submarines than those that were lost. And the British were able, were unable to keep up the merchant construction against versus ships that were, uh, were sunk. So, but this all turned in the latter part of uh, 1917, and by 1918, uh, the convoy successes were working, the U-boat losses were getting excessive. Uh, they had primitive air cover now, and uh, in fact, here's one here, the uh, flying boats out of uh, Eastern uh, Ireland, uh, sank uh, 17 submarines in 19, uh, 1918. So that pretty much, uh, with these successes and finally recognizing that, well, oh, oh, the other thing was an interesting thing, is that uh, the ratio, uh, like in 1916, ships, uh, submarines lost to ships sunk, was like 70 ships were lost to one submarine being sunk. By uh, the early, by the middle of uh, 1918, it was about, uh, it was still in favor of the Soviets, but it was like, uh, it was like six to one, five to one. And this could be more than compensated by uh, new construction in, in the merchant uh, navy. And so, in effect, the, Admiral, the German Admiralty recognized that uh, the submarines were not gonna pull it off. And they recommended to uh, the uh, high command that uh, we cease the uh, submarine. We cease uh, offensive operations. Uh, 
also on uh, ships on October the 7th in the German Navy. Final sinking had been done on October the 7th in the Bay of Biscay by, by Arno. Uh, the fleet, sir, the fleet uh, service fleet mutinied, but the U-boat crews stayed loyal to, the, uh, to their officers and uh, There's the message it went out. Commence return of crews immediately because current negotiations. All manner of merchant uh, warfare forbidden. U-boats already returning attack warships only by day. That came out in the Admiralty. And there they are. There's a lot of them still ready to, full of piss and vinegar, ready to go, but that was it. And you can see the, they were all, there was about 160 of them tied up uh, there in December of 1918. I kind of got, kind of got off on a couple bad tracks there, so forgive me for that. But that's it. 